is recording. Um, so first of all, welcome back. Hopefully everybody had a safe and happy holidays. Um, one other, one kind of one general announcement and just in terms of uh, Meta as a whole, if you hadn't seen, um, I think it was over the holiday break or maybe right at the beginning of the holiday break, um, our CEO, Paul Kraft, made the decision to keep the offices closed. Um, originally, we were gonna open back up sometime, I believe this week. Um, they've made the decision just based on the COVID numbers, et cetera, um, to go ahead and keep the office closed through the, at least the end of the month. So they continue to monitor you know, the situation based on, I think. Oh, you're muted. Eric, you're muted again. Yeah. Somebody muted me. Okay. Or maybe I <laughs> muted myself. Sorry. <laughs> so I think, as I said before, I, I suspect, you know, based on the information coming out of the governor's office, you know, that that's, we're probably going to pretty closely follow that, but just keep an eye on uh, communications. Um, you know, I don't really know what we're going to do in terms of in-person versus continuation of Zoom training, you know, as we get later into the year. You know, I will say going forward, I think there's, there's you know, our goal is going to be to strike a balance between the two. Um, we're not going to, you know, even post-COVID, we're not going to just kind of turn our back on the online training and the availability of it. Um, we'll work hard to try to come up with a balance that works for everybody. Um, so you will see in the near future, um, when you attend trainings, we're going to add an additional question um, to the training survey that goes out, just asking for some feedback of you know, that specific training and whether or not you felt the Zoom uh, format of it is the most appropriate. Um, that'll give us some feedback directly from you guys so that we can start kind of looking down the road as we start laying out training schedules for probably mainly for next year, but even the tail end of this year, if there's certain trainings that we want to do in person versus um, being in Zoom. So look for some of that. All right, the agenda, we don't have too full of an agenda today. Um, I'm going to go over some power school ticket escalation item. Um, I was going to say this is brand new, but I'm going to have to change and say that this is... <laughs> coming soon. Um, we're not quite there yet on it, but I'll explain. Um, we're going to give, Elizabeth's going to give an update on the transcript update. Um, a lot of work has been ongoing. Uh, we're currently wrapping up phase two, getting ready to pop into phase three. Um, so she's going to talk a little bit about that, give you guys who maybe haven't seen it or haven't seen it in a while, give you a little bit of a quick demo of it. We have a special guest, Susan Payne, over from the She's recently migrated over from the EMS team to Jennifer Schmidt's old role of the PSSR manager. So she's going to give an update on the, the PSSR. Um, and then Ma Amanda Stenger is going to give you a quick update on 20.11. Today's will really just be kind of an overview. There's kind of a, there's a lot packed into 20.11. And then uh, she'll tell you about some additional materials coming in the near future. And then Sarah as well as maybe if Corey has to jump into, I'm not sure, on the meta customizations catalog update. And then we've got Steven representing the uh, scheduling team to give some, some updates on scheduling, keep folks on track. Things are gonna obviously be different this year. Um, and just as these guys get into work days and some of that, I think, uh, you know, making sure that everybody understands the process. And then last but not least, um, we have Steve, the new guy, Williams, popping in to give a little bit of an update on Power School Enterprise reports. All right, so let me. All right, um, currently, as you probably should all be very aware, um, in order to submit a web help desk or a, a, a case, I guess, to us, that you need us to take a look at. There's really two different ways to do that. You can either do it currently through the web help desk, going out to the web and going to the help desk.metasolutions.net and entering in a ticket. So this is just um, from my perspective and it may look slightly different for you based on your, your access and your um, privileges within the web help desk system. But when I go in, you know, the, the main things to keep in mind is if you're trying to direct a ticket to us, you wanna make sure that it gets um, 
identified as request types as PowerSchool support. And then there's some request subtypes that uh, can be identified here. If you're just looking for the most generic core PowerSchool is probably the one to go with. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the request detail. Um, so that's one way, probably, probably not. I think what we're seeing the last probably year or two is a shift away from using the web uh, to submit those web help desk tickets. And what we're seeing oops, is more of a shift to folks using email, which makes sense. Um, so right now you would submit, um, depending on if you're trying to run a ticket down the path of core PowerSchool help, or if you're running a ticket down the path of PowerSchool scheduling help, you'd use one of these two email addresses. Um, and just like you would do on the web help desk ticket side, the web version, uh, the same thing applies um, in the email version. You know, again, we're looking for as much detail that you can put into that email as possible. Any attachments that you attach to that email, those attachments will, will make their way over into the web help desk system. So no worries there. Okay. Um, when we talk about ticket details, you know, the more information, I guess kind of the high level is the more information you guys can give us up front, the better. Um, it, per, it reduces the amount of back and forth that we have to do in order to maybe be able to duplicate. You know, from our perspective, what we're always trying to do when we get a new, a new ticket or new case from you, um, whether we go in and try to reproduce that issue on your production server, or we go in and we try to do it maybe on a non-production server that hopefully either has your data running on it or some similar data set. So the more, the more detail, the more information you can give us on you know, steps to maybe reproduce the issue, et cetera, the better. Okay. Um, this is just kind of, this is something we, we provide all new districts when they come in and we talk to them and we take them through our, our statement of work. Um, it's always our goal uh, between the hours of eight and four, any ticket that we receive, um, our goal is to at least get that ticket assigned and have some response on that ticket within a 24 hour window. Um, I won't say that that's a, an SLA, a service level agreement by any means, but it's always a goal of the team that we, we do our best to, to maintain that. You'll even see different times during the school year, if things get really busy. Um, we may have a generic uh, message that we'll post on tickets saying we received it. You know, we're, we're receiving an inordinate amount of tickets at the time at this time and we'll get to your ticket as soon as we can. So that's during normal business hours. So what do we do if you guys encounter a high priority issue after hours? Right now, <laughs> we don't do anything, um, unfortunately. Uh, so it's kind of come to our attention, I would say just prior to the, the holiday break, there was um, within another department within Meta, there was a situation and kind of looking at what was going on with some of the other departments. Um, it kind of made me take a look at our own processes and go, wow, you know, we, on the power school team, we, we really don't have a process to address that either. Um, so what we're going to do, and I'm, I put on here coming soon, we'll have a new email address that you guys can send emails to if you encounter a priority one after hours. Now, if it's anything other than a priority one and you're encountering an issue and you still want to, you know, go ahead and create that case, after hours, you would use the normal PowerSchool help at metasolutions.net. You would not use the after hours, okay? So what do we mean by priority one? Um, the short and dirty of is anything that truly is a critical business. So your, your server is down, um, you've noticed something weird, there's some data loss issues going on. Um, maybe you suspect that there's some sort of a security breach. Um, we can, as we get better examples to this, we'll come back and we can revisit this with all of you. Um, but what we don't, you know, what we want to do is, you know, we want to give you the ability to bring these P1 issues to our attention after hours so that if there's, if it's something we need to address and rather than having it wait until the following morning, you know, we want to get a jump start on it and try to address it as soon as possible. Like I said, I, I think the reason this hasn't been an issue in the past. It's just because very rarely do we have anything that would I that I would consider a priority one. 
if the if your server goes down for some reason, we have 24/7 monitoring occurring on the, all of those production boxes. And so, if a PowerSchool server is unavailable, we're being notified anyway, and it's being addressed. Um, but there may be some unique situations or circumstances where something else comes up, and, and you guys want to bring those to our attention. So, I will. This will end up being the email address that you're going to use to notify us of high priority issues after hours. Um, you can use this email address now. It'll create the ticket. The issue that I have right now is it's, there's some internal process or processes that's not, that are not quite ironed out yet. So as soon as those processes are ironed out in terms of who's going to be notified and how we're going to notify folks, um, primarily me, um, after hours that there's been a, a high priority ticket come in. Um, I'll get another communication out to everybody and we'll probably remind folks that, you know, here's the three email addresses. This is the one that's only to be used for priority one issues. Okay. Questions on that new, slightly new process, I guess. All right. Um, I am going to turn it over to, we're going to push right into Elizabeth's uh, time slot here. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, let her give you an update on the uh, standardized transcript. Great. Good morning, everybody, and happy new year. I'm going to go ahead and um, this is kind of a, a review of the meta standardized transcript project. The did discuss this in our November district leader meeting. So we're just gonna go over and give everybody kind of an update um, as of January. So as a reminder, the purpose of this project is um, having the ability to include the new state requirements um, on the transcript, the graduation readiness seals, um, in addition to those um, graduation requirements. Another purpose is to reduce the transcript redundancy. Um, we, you know, many of you know that you have multiple transcripts based on say the building. So if you have multiple high schools, you have uh, the same transcript copied in each high school. So that was one of our goals was to reduce that redundancy for you. And um, the final one here is the support of that transcript object report. So at the end of this project, um, that will be happening. You can still use it. It will still be there. We will not be removing them, but we um, as Meta will de-support that process. Um, the transition, the phases that we're doing, um, every district must participate at some point during the um, project. The district communication and participation is critical it's going to be a team, you know, we're gonna be a team together. You and your meta team member um, will be working, you know, closely together to make sure that we have your transcript built. Um, we do have a kickoff meeting at the beginning of the phase that your district is assigned. And then during the phase, we just ask that your participants um, review, validate the data and just communicate everything with your meta team member um, in your web help desk ticket. And then at the, our goal is for at the end of your phase to have a fully functional meta standardized transcript. And as part of the, the phase, you know, web help desk tickets are created with the district leaders and then district leaders are able to, you know, you can copy whomever you like. Some districts copy um, their counselors on it. Some have, you know, uh, administrative assistants or other administrators that are in charge of that part of, um, you know, work in their district. So they copy them on it. So it's not just the heavy load on the district leader themselves, but you are the main contact for us. So that's where we start with our, um, Web help desk tickets. Here's the current project status. We are um, finishing up our third group of districts. So we've done a beta, beta phase with five districts. We've um, had phase one and phase two, and we are going to be starting phase three here in a couple of weeks. 
Um, in future phases, we, we've been doing, they've been at rolling phases, and we prioritize the list of districts based on their semester two start dates. Project status as of right now, we are finishing up phase two. Phase two districts will have a final meeting on January 15th. Um, watch your web help desk tickets for more information if you're in phase two, one of those districts. Um, and if you still have, you know, questions or issues or concerns or feedback, please feel free to use that web help desk ticket for um, information to communicate with your meta team member. Um, right now, this is where we're sitting. We can see um, the list here for you to see our phases, the beta, et cetera, on down when they started, when they ended. Um, and here's the list of our phase three districts that we will be reaching out to you. So a meta team member will create a web help desk ticket if you don't have one, have it yet already with um, the information regarding phase three and this rollout and kind of the expectations for you. Um, if your district, if you see yourself on here and you are not able to participate in phase three, um, just communicate that on the web help desk ticket. We can you know, work with each district on what phase they're in. So, but it will be going to the district leader. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, our goal is right now, you can see seven phases. So we are starting phase three in a couple of weeks, about two weeks. So we've got a little way to go, um, but then here's phase three and then upcoming phase four. The next piece we're gonna do is just look at um, a quick demo on an in PowerSchool, but before I move to the demo, just wanted to see if anybody has any questions about the phases. Yeah. Okay, great. So we're just gonna go into PowerSchool here and show you where you will be seeing this transcript. So you would navigate to a student and there will be a new um, student page titled Custom Reports. Once we navigate to this page, um, this page will show a landing page of reports. Right now you will have a this standardized transcript and we will click on that. And this is where it's going to load that transcript. It'll take just a couple minutes as it collects the data on this particular student. And so here is a copy of this new standardized transcript. Um, we will, again, Meta, your Meta team member will be working on creating this for your district and be able to make a couple tweaks here and there, maybe on location of items, but it is a standardized transcript. So everybody will more than likely start with one that looks similar to this. Um, and the couple of items I just wanna point out, and this is our, you know, part of the purpose of our project is to be able to include items like right here, the graduation seals. Um, as you know, the current object report, that transcript object, we cannot pull this data in unless we create a specific object report for each specific seal or combination of seals because they're images, they're pictures that we have to embed into that. The um, report here the coding that's being used is actually going out and looking at the student's um, either graduation pathway screen or their special program screen to pull the data from what you already entered into PowerSchool, reflecting whether they have um, earned the requirements for the SEALs or not. So as soon as that data is entered um, into the student's record in PowerSchool, it will populate onto this transcript. You will not have to select a specific transcript saying, oh, they earned the seal, I need to print the seal transcript. It will all be here. Another addition is this wording right here, which is not included um, on many object reports right now, is it's a requirement in Ohio about the seal of biliteracy. There is specific wording that is supposed to be on a student's transcript. So we've made sure to include that 
Again, that, is, that data there is coming specifically from the special programs. So as soon as you um, enter that student into that special program that they've earned it, it will then populate onto this transcript. Um, we also have added this graduation requirements, the competency and readiness, put it up in the section with the pathways on whether they've met it or not. But this is something new that we've added in here. And then the, re the rest of the data is kind of, you know, district specific on which boxes some boxes some districts put, you know, GPA credit history or summary or test, um, and some don't. So that'll be something that you'll just work with your um, Meta team member with on what you want to include. To print the... Oh, I was just yeah. going to say, Elizabeth, we did have a quick question. Where is the attendance oh. for each year? And Lisa, so, that, you know, that's a district specific thing. Some have it, some do not. So that would be something that if you have it, you would want, you know, to re it would be added to your transcript. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, unlike an object report, when you go to print that, print it, it goes to your report queue. Here, this is a PowerSchool page, so you will be utilizing the print page feature up in the right hand corner to print the page. And I have a completed one for you to see here. So I use the um, print this page and it printed out and it looks, you know, like a beautiful printed transcript. So that is our, the, you know, brief overview here of the project, its status and how we navigate to a student's page. Are there any other questions? Thank you for that question. And, earlier. I don't see any other coming in the chat. Okay. Well, great. So phase three districts. Um, this document, everybody just so you know, this document here is out in the um, end user documentation for our district leader meeting in January. Um, but phase three districts on this list here, you will be, if you haven't yet, um, getting a web help desk ticket with some more yeah, information. I, I do want to jump in here too because I and this had to have been a timing issue yesterday. We were making some some changes with our phase three and phase four districts. Those phase four I don't think are right. And the what we're doing is we have a, about eight districts per phase. So we're we're gonna need to update that. So just I'll kind of an sure FYI. I see one yeah. is on there twice. So yeah, that the phase the one. phase three is good. The phase four are a little off, but yeah, you're right. Okay. I think it was a copy and paste issue. So. Oh yeah, it looks like that. Knox Cardington, Knox Cardington. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I'll update this and uh, put a new copy out, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. No problem. Okay. Oh, we have a quick question. Will these be able to be printed for multiple students at once? for like a whole example, like a whole senior class before graduation? Um, yes, that is, that is one of the goals of the project as well, to have a mass print functionality. Um, we do not have that functionality right now, but it is on our um, list of goals at the end of the project. Can I ask a question in regard to that? Uh, Vern, I know you asked, you asked the question or anybody else can jump in here too. As, as a district and when you, when you would need that ability to mass print, when, when would be the heaviest time of the year? Because we were kind of anticipating that that would maybe be more of a spring, you know, toward the end of the school year that folks would really need it. Um, you know, keeping in mind, in the meantime, you can still go back to uh, you can still go back to the, the report, that's the transcript version that you already have out there in the object reports, if you really need to mass print, but. Yeah, I unmuted quick. Um, for us, typically, I think um, our guidance folks will run transcripts for all students, like at the end of a semester. And so, you know, it's twice okay. a week. And I think it, 
I want to say they usually even run them like, you know, the end of the first semester, they'll run it for all classes, all four grade levels. That way they can just see what their, what courses they completed, where they stand with their credits and that kind of thing. I think I know, I'm, you know, oh, go ahead. I know, I know for me here at Mohawk, I do mass print at the end of each semester to do a no, new upload to parchment so students have accurate transcripts to send where they need to send them okay. for all grade levels. I think I think based on when you know, the time frame as to when we will have all districts pushed through these phases, you know, that's an early spring, mid spring time frame. You know, I think our goal is still going to be to align it toward the end of the overall project that will have the mass print capability available to you. But as Elizabeth said, it's on our it's on our to do list. It's, you know, say it's a high priority but it's you know there's other items there that are high priority there too um so it will be coming we will definitely have it there before the end of this year and about that time when we have everybody moved through and and moved over to this new standardized transcript okay thank you everybody i think susan i believe you're up next Okay, good morning, everyone. Screen share here. Um, Erica says I can't share screen. I turned it on. Yeah, thank, I, thank you. you. Should be Can you see the agenda right now? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about um, our new – can you now see um, the Word doc? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, we, we will be releasing next week the new student grade collection. Uh, ODE opened it in October. It is uh, part of the SLDS grant from the federal government, and it is to aid schools in early detection of students at risk for not graduating. Um, we realize, of course, that <laughs> every school has something in place that helps them, you know, identify these students, but this is going to be just one more tool to help with that. Um, it is why we started collecting attendance all year. That's part of the criteria. It's why we started um, collecting discipline all year, because that's also part of it. And the uh, GC collection that we released in December, which shows all students who have received high school credit prior to this year, that goes up as well. So those are some of the criteria that uh, ODE is using that the federal government is requiring to help determine if a student is at risk of not graduating. So we're releasing it next week. Um, our thoughts are, you know, this is something that you're going to run when storing grades is completed throughout the year. It is going to, the file is going to grow. ODE realizes that it will be a huge file by the end of the year um, because you're going to report quarter grades, semester grades, year end grades, basically anything you're, you know, you would publish on a report card um, can go up to ODE. So with releasing it next week, we realized that the weekend of the 16th might not be a good time for a lot of you if your semester's ending and you're gonna be needing to store grades and you don't want your, your environment down for any period of time. So we will request that it be installed on the 16th, but only for the districts that opt in. Everybody else is gonna get it Jan January 30th. So if you are a district that your semester ended in December 
and you've got grades stored and you know you want to get going on this absolutely just shoot me an email we will get you get it installed in your environment for january 16th and you can start you know your emis coordinator can start submitting this data for everyone else it's just going to be with the january 30th release you know as normal so there are some requirements in in you know to do this Part of it is, you know, the EMIS coordinators and the staff who store the grades are going to have to work together. Um, you don't want your EMIS coordinator running this, you know, when perhaps we've stored grades and something went awry and you've got some bad grades or whatever. So you really want to, they're going to have to work close together. Um, ODE has also said that they're not going to process this nightly. They, it's just too big. So it they will only process on weekends. So, um, you know, there's really no advantage to submitting it several times a week or anything. So um, grade scales is one thing that has to be mapped and that'll be done at the district level. Final grades and the reporting term setup will need mapped and that is done at the school level. Historical grades with no section number will be ignored because part of this is it has to match up with courses and sections you're reporting in the staff course collection for the year. So say a student comes in semester two, they have credits earned from a previous school, you input those in historical grades, you should not be reporting. So because they won't have an associated section, they won't be pulled and that will help um, you know, not get data out there that you don't need reported. That will also help to in school, exclude summer school grades, which they don't want. And if you do require, you have a special, you know, situation, we have um, an exclude functionality that's gonna be available at the course level, the section level, and even at the historical grade level. So for instance, you have a student that's auditing a class, let's say, and you just have them in with everybody else. That might be one that the historical grade will be something that you want to exclude on that level. Or perhaps you've created a separate section for your audit students. So maybe that section would need. And of course, at the course level, you know, maybe it's a course that um, it really isn't for high school credit or something. You just put the credit in for eligibility purposes or whatever. But we want to do to be able to exclude on those three levels if need be. And we will have a detailed step sheet, you know, but we wanted to give you kind of an overview and let you see what the screens are going to look like. So we'll do that now. Um, let me scroll down here. So the first thing that we'll need is at the school level in the final grade and reporting term setup, we've added two fields. One is grade status and one is reporting term. So for instance, if you open Q1, at the bottom, these two fields have been added, grade status and reporting term. The grade status, there are um, three levels that OD has identified. F is for a final grade, which is when you actually give them the high school credit. I is what they call interim grade, but it's for a grading period or term. So in our world, that's more what we would think of as like a quarter grade or a trimester grade or, you know, the grades that lead up to the final grade, but not a final grade. And then reporting term, ODE has identified, gosh, there's several, like a dozen different terms, um, six weeks, nine weeks, trimesters, semesters, all year, either there's several, um, reporting terms that they've established. So at this time, you'll want to um, map that to that. You know, and as everyone knows in PowerSchool, this is an alphanumeric field and ODE's identifier for year long is the two alpha, it's YE. So this absolutely has to be mapped for everything because everybody's got Y1 out there and it needs to go to YE. So definitely these will need mapped. And like I said, this is by school. So you have to go into each building to do this. Um, I'll pause and make sure there's no questions on the school setup. I 
I can't look see like there's it. anything. I, I, there's say, I can't see the <laughs> chat. So there's nothing in the chat. So I think you're good. Okay. So the next level then is at the district level. And this is where it's going to get a little iffy here. Okay. Um, we all know that there's special grading scales we've set up for this, that, and everything else. So the things to remember with the grading scales are A through F will not need any mapping, regardless if you have, you can see in this example, they have pluses and minuses. We're just going to drop the pluses and minuses. So any A through F codes will not need mapped. Okay, they will pull verbatim for what they are. And the pluses and minuses can be ignored, but any other grade will need mapped. Now, the first thing I said was, why do we have to map I's? Why do we have to map W's? Well, we found, you know, in different schools, these may mean different things. The I, to me, means incomplete. It might be emerging to you. Um, to me, the, the P means passing, but to you, it might mean something different. So if it's not A through F, it has to be mapped. So all these things have to be mapped to get to the grades that ODE will accept. Another thing that we need to point out is a lot of your default grade scales have an associated special grade scale. So if you do it in this particular grade scale, you may have to also do it in the specials grade scale where you have like with the code set up or things like that. Because you can see in here, they have the withdrawal part of it right in this one, but some defaults do not. And grades that are not reportable would not need maps. So for instance, if they had, I thought this one example had an audit, but maybe not. There was, um, right here it is, the N is an audit. So that would not need mapped because that's not one you want reported to ODE. And this will be, again, at the district level for any course that has a core area code attached. Okay. And we do have, we do have one question. Sure. Is there a way to math do this? Or are they gonna go have to do each grade scale individually? each grade scale individually. Um, when the EMS coordinator does run the report, we have included the DCID at the top of the grade scale so that you can see which grade scale needs mapped if one gets missed, perhaps. Um, remember too, though, you know, this isn't all your elementary grade scales. This isn't all your, you know, K-8, art, music, all those grade scales maybe that perhaps you have set up differently. All the, those don't matter. It's only the ones that are going to get high school credit. So I know it, it feels like it's going to be huge, but I think when you think back to, you know, it's only these high school credit, it might not be quite as big as is initially thought. Okay. Okay. And then they also asked um, the school level things. Is that going to be individually as well, or can that anything be done in mass there? Um, currently, we don't have a mass ability on that, um, but definitely we can look into that. Okay, and then one other comment was they sure. use an E instead of an F. So okay, then your, your E will add to an F. Okay, so anything A through F will pull, but if you have an E and it means an F, then you'll just map that over here to the F. Okay, and then one more thing popped up. Sure. Um, is this document going to be in our um, end user folder for from the for this meeting? Well, we were thinking that the detailed instruction is really what we want to publish for everybody. This is more or less just a here's what the screens are going to look like. Plus, it's not finalized, so I would hate to give you this and then it look different when it gets finalized. Okay. Okay. So maybe then maybe we can just say when you get it ready, we'll if you Absolutely. give it to us, we can send it out to the district leaders as well. Absolutely. More? Okay. Yep, we can do that. Oh, a couple more came in. Sure. Uh, will we have to set up the final grade status on Y1, S1, Q1, and so on? Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Because some schools give credit at the semesters and some do not. 
And we have no way of knowing that unless you tell us here the status. So does your school give credit at the semesters, semester one and two? If they do, this is a final grade. If they do not, they do not issue it till year end, then this is an interim grade. Okay. And another one, will this mm -hmm. be something we have to do every year at the district and building level for high school credit courses and grading scales? We are, and, and that's something we need your input on. That's, we have talked about making that part of the year end process that it would roll over, or is that part of, you need to revisit every year to make sure nothing's changed. We have okay. talked about that. And uh, we have a comment that says, I see this is on AFG, average final grade. Not everyone has AFG turned on, most don't. How will that be handled? So the AFG is only for those schools using it. There will actually be a checkbox if you use AFG because it is the minority, not the right bulk, okay? Susan, I, I, I have a, a, a question for you, sure. this is Linda. Sure. So if I am giving a semester grade to a full year class, at that point, they are not earning credit. But if I'm giving a semester grade to a semester class at that point, those kids are earning credit. So I would assume I would map each of those as they truly are. It, it's not an issue that the S1 for full year is no credit, but the S1 for semester is. That is correct. Okay. That is absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. So let's look at the other, the excludes, just to give you an idea. So if you're excluding a course from FR reporting, it's down below the dual credit, below the block scheduling. There's just a checkbox that says this course I don't want to go. At the section level, very similar. It's down below the overrides. There's an exclude from FR reporting checkbox. And then actually on the historical grades, it's under the blue Ohio State information banner and it's down below Cori area code override there is the exclude from FR. Okay, and then to clarify, um, so there's going to be a checkbox that's going to be added. Correct. For I'm this is for AF the AFG piece. Yes, that's for that checkbox will be when they run the report. Oh, okay. When they run the okay. report, actually, yes. it won't be added to any of the correct school pages. I yes. Guess. Yep. It just be part of the state. Yes. Export. Okay. Yes, part of the state export exactly. Um, it is important to note that these are not part of any local report card indicator. Um, they're not part of any ODE issued student transcript. These are questions that, you know, district had of the state when, when they initially said they were going to start doing this. Is this for, and it is not, it, you know, this is just to fulfill the grant requirements of helping schools identify students at risk of not graduating. Okay. So there will be a second release on January 26th, and it is going to contain the ACT pre-ID update. Um, you know, when the state funded ACT administration started, it was for juniors only. <laughs> Last year with COVID, they weren't able to test and districts are telling us that there are some seniors that they wanna put in. And currently the pre-ID extract won't allow any grade but grade 11. And so we're gonna, we're adding to that, that you can make a student selection and tell it, I want them for all these kids. So if you have seniors that are gonna test in that ACT, um, we're getting that corrected. There is some CTE March D reporting that will be released with that. And hopefully some grad pathways updates for the new codes out and the way we will handle those. And this will be installed to your environments on January 30th and we'll know, notify everyone as, as normal with that. And here again, if only if you opt in for the uh, January 16th, will you get this new FR reporting? Um, but everybody else is just gonna get it on January 30th with the other releases. And one other thing we want, I want to touch base on um, 
is the upcoming reporting that ODE is going to require for learning models, hardware questions, and connectivity questions. I know a lot of you are having to um, submit this, some overall numbers uh, right about now, I believe, to MECOCN. Um, this is in addition to that. And ODE is published in draft mode only, what they're going to do. Okay, for FY21, they're going, you're supposed to report a student status on, on a spring window in the month of March. And there's going to be district and building attributes, as well as um, applicable program codes for students. We are not releasing this in January, only because ODE has only released all this info in draft, and we hate to release it and then have a bunch of changes. And since it isn't to be done until March, our plan is to release it with the February release. Um, it won't be a lot of um, new functionality. Uh, there's just in the DN, the learning models will be things like, uh, let me show you the draft from ODE. Things like, you know, what school start the year? Were they five day in? Were they remote? Were they hybrid? or they were closed. And then what you'll do is you'll report every date that it changed. So for instance, if you started five day in, come Thanksgiving, you went to remote until after Christmas break, you would just enter one entry with the date that you went to remote. And then say after or you decided to close until after Martin Luther King Day, you would put in the date that you decided to close. And then Martin Luther King Day, you came back hybrid you know then you would have the date martin luther king day we came back hybrid so that's the overall reporting and then program codes for the students will be like exceptions to those deals so you know if you were five day in for everybody but these five kids you know decided not to then you would put the program on code on them that says they are all remote or what have you and that's they're saying they don't want you to be entering program codes. You know, this kid was in five day in, went to remote, went back to five day in, went to remote. They don't want all that. You know, it's only if they committed to say, we're gonna be remote for the whole quarter or that's what they're expecting to see. And those program codes will be entered just like any other program code with um, start dates and in special programs but we wanted to give you a heads up that that was coming and let you know why you know, we weren't necessarily jumping on that for January. Do we have any questions with that? I don't see, I don't see any in the chat. Okay, well that's um, all I had to talk about today and Everyone stay safe and thank you, Susan. Thanks for uh, joining us. All right, rolling right along. Amanda, I think uh, you have some you have some extra time in your uh, thirty minutes now. <laughs> oh man! No or maybe you can there. pass the buck to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get started here. All right, 20.11, are you able to see my slide shown here? I do. Okay, good. Okay, so we are gonna talk about some features that were added in PowerSchool 20.11. Okay, just some highlights here. Uh, we're gonna briefly go over what's included in the updates, both 20.11 and 20.11.0.1, if you're keeping track, um, including some new functionality that they added, some enhancements, some resolved issues, all sorts of fun. You can get the full details on all of these features um, on all the updates from all the releases by going to PowerSchool Help, which if you're in PowerSchool, you just click your question mark, go to System Help and Release Notes. And you can see in the screenshot here, you can see the current release notes are going to be the ones that are on top, but you can see all previous just by scrolling down. Uh, the current plan is to install this version 20.11.0.1 this weekend, so January 9th to 10th. 
Uh, you should have had an email from Eric where he sent out what your district's plan time is. If you have any questions, just be sure to respond back to him on that email and we can get that worked out. Um, it was from December 21st, so you might have to dig back a little bit if you need to. Um, so this, what, we're going to go briefly over some things. I'm just going to show you what they are. This presentation is out on our, um, our website if you need to look at it. And then we do plan on releasing some additional videos to kind of help supplement and go over some of the newer features. Um, and then as always, Jason Springle does a fantastic job with the Insider episode. So I'll have a link to that at the end of the presentation as well. All right. So first we're gonna talk about, they added some grad plan updates, um, which they were some big updates compared to what the grad planner did before. I don't quite think they're fully functional to what we're looking for here in Ohio, but they are out there. Um, they added the ability, so you can set a certain GPA or grade score, like a letter grade, um, in order for a student to meet the requirements of that grad plan. Um, the caveat with the grade is they just use a generic default scale of A, B, C, D, or F. So if you use any grade skills other than that, you won't be able to customize that. So you wouldn't be able to use the, the minimum grade. Uh, the other thing is the minimum GPA. We tested that, it seems to work correctly. So you can set a minimum GPA if maybe you have um, like a, an honors diploma you wanna track them on and they need a certain minimum GPA, you can now add that and it will tell you whether they've met it or not. The other huge thing they added was this testing piece. It's different from before. So now you have some more complex testing rules that you can add. Um, you can say like how in the screenshot example that they can take the ACT or SAT test is required. They just need one of them. And then you can go even further and you can add requirements for each test. So you can say for the ACT, there's minimum scores they need to meet on each of the subjects of that test. And same with SAT. The caveat with that is we're used to grad pathways where a student can kind of get the best of any test that they take in order to meet those requirements. That is not how it works in the grad plan. They have to meet all of them in one test is what it's looking at. So you wouldn't be able to combine, you know, my math and science score from my November results with my reading and composite score with my January test results. It has to be all in one test. And so that's why you only have the options of pass or failed as well. There's no in progress. There's no, I've met some, but I haven't met others. It's either you meet all those score requirements that were set up for that grad plan, or you didn't meet those score requirements set up for that grad plan for that test. So they are planning, they are talking about adding even more functionality to it, but these were the big ones that they added to grad plan. Um, so like I said, we'll talk about it a little bit this afternoon, but it's not quite, I think, what we're really wanting here in Ohio, especially. And next, they've made quite a few attendance updates. Um, one of them I know a lot of people have been asking about is you can now group by track in the sub portal. Uh, it works exactly like it does in the teacher portal. The substitute, once they log in, they just toggle that back and forth when they go to take attendance if they want to see the students on their tracks. Okay. Another thing that they've added is just a little bit of an enhancement when you're doing meeting attendance. Um, basically what happens is now instead of having to click up here to set your attendance code and then click in each meeting you need to apply that to, you can actually just click into the meeting period and the attendance codes will come down as a drop down list that you can do. So it just makes it a little bit easier to work with. Amanda? Yeah. I've had a comment from many of our secretaries. They absolutely hate that. Do they really? Yeah, because it used to be they could click up top to pick their default and then just click in any meeting or day kind of thing mm -hmm. and it would autofill. Now they've got to click and scroll down or have to type, you know, um, the code in. Okay. It is actually, they say, more inefficient in this new method. And they go, can we go yeah. back to the old? Is what they were asking. I said, it's part of the update. I, I have no control, but it's But like, you are a champion. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 told him I, I told him I would put it into the ideas portal that 
they have made it more inefficient for the secretaries. Yeah, because, that okay. That's, yeah, it seems like they've gotten rid of the default functionality in that. Maybe they uh -huh. need to add another, you know, yeah. an additional checkbox or something. If you want that to, in fact, be the default, I don't know. They just, they need to bring that. I agree. Yeah. Rich, yeah. go ahead and sit, submit like a ticket or something, and I'll take that, and I'll run with it up to PowerSchool as well. Okay. Because I, and, that does seem like a loss of functionality right there. Yeah. Yeah. We had another district here say that they've heard similar things from their staff. Awesome. That's good feedback to know. Let me know and I'll push it right back to them. Thanks guys. Good feedback. Um, okay. Where am I here? Okay. We're the next attendance update. Sorry, I lost my track. Um, I'm not sure a lot of you are going to be able to take advantage of this because it is just for meeting attendance. Um, but they've added some enhancements around clock in clock out feature in meeting attendance. Um, so you have to, first you have to be using meeting attendance, then you have to enable clock in, clock out for meeting attendance. And then there's some additional preferences that you can set and attendance preferences regarding um, some recommendations you can have it set up to make for tardy versus absence attendance codes. So in attendance preferences, you would set up those thresholds, whether it's a tardy or an absence, um, you can do them in minutes or you can do them in percentage. And when you um, watch Jason Springle's video and even kind of think about it with absences, it kind of makes more sense to use the percentage because you know you could have a class that's 40 minutes long or an hour long and a percentage is kind of better than a set piece of time because 20 minutes of a 40 minute class is a more of an absence than 20 minutes of a you know hour long class is. But you know, that's all district specific. You can set that up if your district decides to use it. But essentially what will happen is when you go to add a clock in or clock out record for that student, it can um, suggest an attendance code. So in this example we have shown here, it was a clock in record that we added. Um, it automatically filled in with the current time that I did this. And it recommended since the student had missed 94% of their scheduled period that you use an absence code. And so you could select your absent code if you wanted to and put any comments. Um, vice versa, if I was doing a clock out and saying the kid was gonna be out for the rest of the day now and it recommended an absent code or I decided whatever code I wanted to use, you can now fill subsequent periods for that meeting attendance so you wouldn't have to go back and do every single one of them okay but again this is only if you're using clock in clock out in meeting attendance and there's another caveat with this that it's only on the attendance page from the start page you can't use it on a student's meeting attendance page and that's because there's some ohio state reporting stuff that's on a student's meeting attendance page and so this this isn't showing up on there it's not for ohio for that so Again, but it is out there if that's something you want to look into. Another attendance update, which I think some of you might be really happy about, is they you can now set it up so that teachers have to put an attendance code in on every student. So this would be for your districts that maybe you want to force um, some of your buildings that want to force a present code on students. You don't want to use the blank default that PowerSchool has. Maybe you're using a P for presence. Um, if you go into attendance preferences and turn this on, the prevent attendance page submit if blank attendance is used that will force teachers to have to have attendance code entered on every single student before they can submit their attendance. Okay, this is setup that's done at the school level. So you'd have to do it for every school that you'd want to use it. Um, but I feel like this would be really handy for those of you who maybe have started wanting to do positive attendance. Um, again, by default, it is not enabled. So if this is something that you want to take advantage of, you would have to go to your school attendance preferences to do that. Next big thing that they added is PowerSchool added a fitness tracking piece. Um, it's a new student page um, added to track a fitness test that the district may administer. Uh, the default files that PowerSchool provides if you wanna import them are for the presidential physical fitness test. Uh, if you want to do any other kind of fitness test, you would need to edit those files. Um, it seems still a little clunky trying to use, but they, it's, it's just a beginning. This is the first iteration, so I'm hoping they improve that as we go on. There is security surrounding this, so you would need to do some security group setup to view the student page and then also to view um, the fitness and student grade scales. Excuse me. Um, PowerSchool, like I said, has provided some code sets to import the presidential physical fitness test. This is done through the data import manager, and there is a specific order that these files would need to be imported in. Um, so what I did uh, for you guys is I took those files from PowerSchool's community and I have uploaded them to our common drive under training documentation um, on our website for fitness tests is what it's called, fitness imports, I believe. 
and I've labeled the files. So each one has a number in front of it of which order it goes into. And I've also in that same um, folder, there's a step sheet that shows you the order of the files, the file name, and where you import them into in Data Import Manager. And a little preview, I have a video coming out on that. So if you, you wanna look at that, that'll walk you through it. And then you can enter in a student's test results. You can do it individually like what you see here, or you can do it in mass where you can just save and continue as you are entering these test scores for students. So this was another big thing added by PowerSchool. They added um, a little bit of tweaks to enhanced health. They've now added the ability to associate a medication to a student without a schedule. So you no longer have to say they take this medication you know, daily at nine o'clock. So now you have those medicines that you can do as needed. You can still log that that medicine is tied to that student, but you don't have that showing up on your daily log with the student's schedule to take it. Uh, one I, I kind of think of obviously is like ibuprofen. Maybe the student has that had headaches, so they just take it as needed. Um, so they did migrate that time that it's required for a medication. Um, so now that you can just enter in a time, you don't have to have that huge code set with every single possible time frame that you want um, put in there. So that was a nice little enhancement. Um, you can also now access the student's health record from the daily log. You don't have to navigate to that student. Um, one of their bigger things that they really touted was the being able to track some vital signs on an office visit. And I definitely wanted to highlight that here because I know some of you have asked me about being able to record blood sugars, but wanting to on the, you know, the diabetes monitoring say high or low. This, it's still not perfect. I still have that enhancement to add that to the monitoring page, but at least here now on office visits under vital signs, you can now enter an actual record for blood sugar levels. Again, it's not perfect. I still would rather see it in the diabetes monitoring since that's where you're wanting it, but that's something that they did add to an office visit kind of as a workaround. Um, and in addition to that, they added blood pressure, temperature, all these options you see here. And they made the office visit, they have collapsible signs. So it's easier to specifically narrow down to what data you wanna look at. So some nice little enhancements there. And the next big one that PowerSchool has added is they now support single sign-on um, with Microsoft or Google for teachers, admin, parents, and students. Um, this is, it looks like it's a pretty intensive process from what Jason has explained on his Insider episode. So again, if this is something you're interested in, that would be a great resource to check out first. Um, but that is something that they are able to do now. I know this is something that a lot of people have kind of asked for. I feel like it would be pretty great for your users to be able to do that, just have that one sign-on. So that's something that you're interested in that is available now and we can put in a ticket and we can help you walk through it as much as we can. Okay, so next, there are quite a few PowerTeacher Pro updates. Um, they've, I have them all listed here. They've added a nice new feature to where you can preview your grade calculations before they actually hit submit and make those changes. So that's nice. Um, they've added and updated a lot of reports here, final grades report, a missing assignment report, a standard grades report. Um, they've added, so assignment standard scores now respect the published scores options on the assignment, a nice new feature to update auto calculated assignment standards. Um, and they made some enhancements to the email from Power Teacher Pro. So some good things coming for your teachers. Now we are applying this update this weekend. So when your teachers first log in on Monday morning and go into Power Teacher Pro, they will get that pop-up that says what's new. And there's a really good about six minute video in there um, that explains a lot of these new enhancements. And again, at this end of this presentation this, on the slide, I have the link towards that video if you guys wanna check it out yourselves. Okay, so a lot of good stuff. So those were most of the new features. Here are some of the enhancements that they've added. Um, as always, the full release notes are available, but I wanted to you know, show you some of them. They've updated the boundary page that you can set up at the district and school level. They've just made some more cosmetic changes to make it easier to uh, navigate and use. Um, change history can now be set to retain records for up to 10 years. So if that's something you're interested in doing, um, please put in a, a ticket and we can work with you on that. It's something that has to be set up server side. Um, they made a change to way you can uh, view attendance change history records, which kind of, I'm not surprised this is coming because those can be such huge records. Um, you can only view them at the school level, which makes sense because attendance is at a school level. And now you can only do a time span of a max of seven days when you're doing that mass, like if you're trying to search for an entire school. They did that because if you pick too large of a date range, you could get too many attendance results coming back and it could really mess up your system. So they've done some enhancements there. 
the course page when you're searching for courses now gives you the option to search by that alternate course number that you if you that's something that you're using in your courses small little change in the admin portal we used to have what's called settings when we click on our initials it's now called manage profile uh, they did the same with teachers they're personalized that's now manage profile it gives a little bit more information but all the other options are still the same there so it adds at least definitely on the admin side, it adds the ability. You can see a picture if you've uploaded a picture for the staff and it gives you like their email address, just a little bit more details it'll show you when you go to manage profile. Um, but the bigger thing that I wanted to add when they, they've done with enhancements um, has to do with uh, quick export DDE, DDA, and our template, templates, excuse me, are now part of security roles. So let's take a look at that. So basically, user roles will now be used to restrict and grant access to things like DDE, DDA, your quick export, and templates using the export edit tab that's on a user role. Previously, if you remember, this tab just applied to data export import manager, and it even said, I believe, data export, data import, when you enter in that little error message or little information message, not an error, it would tell you it was for data export, data import. Now it's for all. So what that means is you, this would be a good time for you to take a look at your security roles um, and update as needed. Make sure the people that you want to have access to these things, such as DDE, DDA, have that ability based upon their roles, because this is a slight change. And we, we ran into it when we were testing this out. Um, I wondered why I couldn't see everything in DDE that I used to, and it's because I didn't have the role that was already created for data export import manager that gave me full access and someone else did. So it is something you want to take a look at. If you haven't reviewed your roles lately, this would be a good opportunity to do it. Um, if you have questions about that or are not sure, again, you can always put a ticket in and we can help you out with that. But it is a small little change that might have a bigger impact than what you would think when it comes to um, accessing DDE. All right. And then some resolved issues. There are over 50 resolved issues between 20.11 and 20.11.0.1. So if you, the full details are available there, not all of these issues were reported by our users, um, but you know, I'm just gonna highlight a few that I saw that were kind of notable. Uh, including has fees when you were filtering courses may have included fee, courses that had fees previously. So that's been resolved. Um, there was an issue where include inactive students was enabled in PowerSchool enrollment. If you're using PowerSchool enrollment, there was an issue with the state reporting fields not being copied over correctly. Um, that's been fixed. Uh, there was also an issue, um, not necessarily an issue. So I was, I was surprised to see this was fixed. I didn't realize it was an issue. But what they've changed is before they said when working with staff security and admin access and roles, um, access for a staff member can only be added to those schools which the district administrator can access, which is a really wordy and weird, confusing way that PowerSchool said, um, said it. But basically what it boils down to is going forward, you're only going to be able to give security access to someone if you have security access yourself. So for example, I'm, you know, I'm, at a bill, I'm at a high school and Elizabeth starts working and she needs access to the you know, middle school. I wouldn't be able to give her that access because I don't have access to the middle school. I could only give her access to the, the high school that because that's where I have access at. So that's something that they apparently saw was an issue and so they corrected that, but that's how it's going to work now. So um, if you're someone who has district administrator access, all you would have to do is give yourself access to that building and then you could give that person access to that building. Okay. And then a couple of our districts got updated to 20.11 and so there were some issues there that they've corrected in 20.11.0.1. One of them is after upgrading to 20.11, you couldn't see grades as part of the unified classroom dashboard if you use that. So that's been fixed with 20.11.0.1. And then also another thing that was fixed in 20.11.0.1 was um, if you were on 20.11, sometimes your data export manager exports that you had scheduled wouldn't run. And so that's supposed to be fixed with this latest episode or latest release, okay? And then there are some known issues. Okay, these are the latest known issues as of 20.11.0.1. Um, it looks like in the co-teaching tables, there's some display issues when the field is null or empty. Uh, this one about the medication frequency, there, um, 
trying to, they're going to be adding a PRN for those medications that don't have a set time. Um, that's not currently in there. You can add it manually right now. Otherwise, they're going to add it automatically when they release 20.11.1. Uh, another thing, sometimes they had an issue where some of the names of new reports displayed incorrectly. They're still looking into that. Um, there are some configuration known issues that are out there. And then there is a known issue currently where if you are looking at the single sign-on for parents or students, um, they might not be able to sign into the mobile applications. So there, looks some, there are some issues there that they're working on right now. Okay. And then one more thing I want to note for you guys, um, they are getting rid of the legacy look. This isn't coming in this newest release. Okay, so this is looking forward here, but beginning with their spring back to school release. So the one that's coming up usually released in April timeframe. So they're looking at 21.4. The new experience that we all got in 20.4 is gonna be the only look available. So you're not gonna be able to use the old or classic look, okay, in the admin and teacher portals. So it, you're still able to use it with 20 21 or 20.11. It's just this next, we're just kind of preparing you for the future here. So if you have any users who aren't using the new experience yet, uh, it might be a good time to really try to push them to get transitioned, to get used to it. Because when we put in that back to school release, most likely in the summer, that's this new experience is gonna be the only experience, okay? So just so you're keeping that ahead, keeping that in your mind and looking forward that this is this is coming so we don't want you to be taken by surprise. And then that's the brief overview. I know it was kind of long, but still kind of a brief overview. Um, I put links to our YouTube channel, keep posted on that. We are gonna be putting some 20.11 related videos out there. Um, Jason's Power School Insider, I know it's really long and it's a huge video, but it is full of good, good information. So if you get a chance to watch that, I definitely recommend it. Even if you just put it in your, you know, small picture in picture viewing while you're working on other th stuff, just having it playing there. It's good, good feedback. And then there's the link for the what's new in 20.11 for teachers. That's also another really good video. Are there any questions? I don't see any. That's intense considering that's the brief overview. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness it was the brief version. Holy <laughs> moly. Oh, imagine how I felt going through this like, oh my gosh, how do I condense this down for people? But yeah, uh, that's it in a nutshell, you know, just a short little nutshell for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm going to stop sharing now. To start Amanda's Cliff Note version. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Miss Chambers, I believe you're up. Morning. Hello. Um, yes, I am going to share my screen. Oops, not that one, that one. Okay, can everybody see? I wanna make sure it shared the right one. The one- Yep, okay. we see the PowerPoint. Slideshow. Okay, good, yeah. thank you. All right, well, it's been so gloomy and awful and, um, you know, 2020 that I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to do something a little more cheerful so we have some blue skies and a bird and hopefully we'll have a better year this year. Um, so um, the customization update, we don't have a lot. Um, Corey's been totally immersed in the transcript project, but he has managed to do some, a couple really cool things that I think you'll like. Most of the, um, um, new things have to do with the report card. So that's kind of our focus. We do have a, one other, one or two other little things, but mostly report card. And the first one, and, and these were a result of enhancement requests from different people um, in our districts. So 
Let's go to, I don't know why that's not working. Second, let's start it. Okay, I did this this morning and it worked fine. Are you so just trying to now, proceed just, to the next slide? Yep. So if you hover down on the bottom left, do you see? No. I did for a second, but I don't know why. You might have to try hitting F5. I saw some options there for a second. Yeah, yeah, they were there for a second. And then, all right, well, we'll just do it this way. Hang on a second. We'll just do this one. And do this one. There we go. OK, so the first um, new thing that Corey has done, which is very, very cool, is added a setting to um, to your report card settings that allows you to print just those standards that have grades. So instead of that big long list, you've got 18, 20 standards, but only four of them have been graded. You can now choose to print only the ones that have been graded. Um, the setting, it's at district or school, you go to Meta Report Card Settings and those settings no longer say Meta Online Report Card Settings, they just say Meta Report Card Settings. We're getting away from the online terminology because this is our meta report card. Um, and then you click over on the standard section and then go to settings and you will see this new one and it is called standards without scores. You really wanna think of it as standards with or without scores when you're choosing your, your drop down. Um, if I say show, I am saying show all my standards with or without scores. I don't care, I wanna see all my standards. If I say do not display, I wanna show only those standards which have been graded. So what does that look like? Um, the one over on the left is, um, with show where I'm showing all standards. So I have standards showing here. I haven't graded them. Um, I didn't mark them as grayed out or anything. They're just standards attached to this course. The one on the right is if I have it on do not display where it lists only those standards that have been graded. So you can see much smaller list. I know we had several people who asked for this. So, um, here it is. It's very exciting that Corey was able to do that. Um, any questions on this? Okay. Um, next thing, HB 410. Until now, we've had two HB 410 columns um, available, uh, and they were the hours absent per year and the unexcused absent per year. And we um, had this enhancement request, but we also realized that some people were unclear what those two fields really meant. So um, I have a screenshot here from the daily attendance info that shows the HB 410 truancy in chronic um, absenteeism summary where you see the total hours absent per year and the unexcused absent hours. Oops, and that should have been over here on per year. Um, what that means is on your report card where it says hours absent per year, that is the total. We just don't have the word total there. Um, because one of the things that we got asked recently was, can we show the total? That is the total. Um, and the unexcused are, if you look at your unexcused absent hours per year, um, it's six. Down in this little summary, I see um, the total 704. My unexcused is six. And those were the fields that we were displaying 
those are the fields you see on quick lookup also so now we've added two more columns so now you have four columns available to choose you can do any combination of columns here that you want um, so now we have the the two that we already had the hours absent per year the unexcused we've added the medical hours and then we have added another one called excused hours absent per year. Now you know the medical hours are not included in your totals. So um, again, looking at my example where this kid has a 1904 total, nowhere here am I seeing 1904 because this is the medical hours are not included. Hours absent is what's sent to the state. However, um, here's a better slide with showing the, the two fields, the total and the unexcused. Um, again, medical are separate items. Um, and the excused hours is a calculated a calculated field just done by math. PSSR is not tracking it. You're not seeing um, anywhere where it says, these are my um, excused hours. It's simply the total hours absent minus the unexcused will give you this excused hours absent if you want to display that on your report card. Some people might want to, other people, you know, Parents have been seeing, oops, <laughs> parents have been seeing this for a while now. So, and I'm sure you've done a good job of explaining to them what HB 410 is, but we did have a couple districts who wanted to see this. So um, again, the medical hours not included in those totals. It's a total separate field. So questions about that. <laughs> Um, yes, Denise, I did see um, on uh, your question about the customization for only showing grades. Yes, Corey rolled those all out last night. So you should be able to go to your settings and, and choose that. So for um, these HB 410, again, you're going to go to your meta report card settings this is in the student information section and it is hours attendance is the link you wanna click on. And um, the new ones, the excused hours and the medical hours absent are set by default to do not display. We didn't wanna just dump them out there and have you see them and go, whoa. So if you want those on, you have to go turn those on. Um, but this is where you would say show it or do not display it. And a reminder, you can always change these labels. So if you wanted hours absent to say total hours absent, you could click over in, um, in the label under total hours and put the word total or total absent. Just keep in mind you've got spacing issues, especially if you're using showing all your days absent, all your days tardy. And now you've added these four columns. Um, as you start, if you start putting a bunch of extra stuff in your labels, it will affect your spacing. Um, you also remember that you could say this is an elementary and you don't um, use S1 and S2 and Y1. You can always hide those. That will move everything over for you as well for your spacing. But um, if you want to add those two, those are out there now. And all you have to do is say, show them. Questions about the HB 410 hours added to the report card. Um, I do see what's the pound after the, I'm not sure what that means. That came from Milton Union. Can you explain a little further what you're talking about? I, I, I think pound is number. What's the number after the slash? Uh, 
Where are you talking about? In the red box. The red box. Are you checking here? Yeah, I think the number before the slash there. Yes, the number after the slash. Oh, the number after the slash. These are your total hours. Um, somebody who does more with attendance and yeah. those are the, like the triggers that those are the state identified number of hours that they have to that's stay under triggers the, i got thank you that's the allowed yeah. hours for hb 410 yeah okay sorry i didn't quite pick up on that <laughs> Okay, um, any other questions about the HB 410? Nice little customization Corey has added. Um, we've also added a new assistant principal field. So in your general, when you go to your meta report card settings and you go to the general section, um, there's now a link to assistant or you'll see it assistant principal setting and it's to show or don't show and um, it will show it here in on your report card that comes from your district school school information same place to pick up principal and superintendent there's an assistant principal field you can add that name there um, so now you can pick it up here so I went there, added Mr. Wizard as my assistant principal, and now I can see it on my report card. Once I said show it, the default is do not display, but if you want to see it, you would just go and show it. Next, Mass Consolidate. Um, it's got a new look, um, a better functionality. Um, so on your Mass Consolidate under Count, you now see these little people icons. So if there are um, two, before it said two, if it had two, um, now you see a, an icon for each person down here. I've got three contacts that would be consolidated. If I had five, I would see five little people um, icons. And um, one of the reasons that Corey did this was because um, the old, what we had before didn't work with the new look. And so while we were in there, he's like, let's make this better. So he added the icons, you can hover over. And as you hover over, it pops up with match one, match two. But you can also click on that icon to go directly to that contact record and look at it. Um, which is something that got broken with the, the new look that he's fixed that. So um, for my first one up here, I've got two icons. I can click on one, it opens in a new tab. If I click on the second one, that opens in a new tab. And I could go to those two tabs, put them on my screen side by side and look at them, compare them if I wanted to or I can at least just go and look at it. I can correct it. I can do whatever to go directly there. Um, so that is a new look. We did have, when I start talking about bug fixes, we did have a little bug here. In some cases, it wasn't everybody, but in some cases, um, the system was failing to recognize that, um, say, a uh, father and a grandfather with the same um, address and same phone number. It was um, finding those as not as um, separate people. It was trying to consolidate them. That has been fixed. So and again, it wasn't everybody. It was just if it identified on something before it got to relationship, it might show up here and you'd have to look at it but that's been fixed. So questions about Mass Consolidate, how that looks now. It's just a nice little um, improvement. Bug fixes, again, Mass Consolidate, uh, um, Corey's fixed that, um, that little glitch. Um, 
there were some headers, PowerSchool containers, and um, an index was printing on the mass print of report cards. That's been addressed and fixed. Um, those, now when you do a mass print, you won't get all that extra stuff you don't want. Uh, we named meta online report cards to meta report cards almost everywhere. Um, data tags, you can put your data tags in the header or the footer of your report card to um, add information to your report cards. Um, they were having a little issue, so Corey has fixed that. So now your data tags will work. And um, there is a, oops, sorry. There is a complete list of bug fixes on the um, in the district leader meeting folder in the end user folder. It's called January release notes. And if you scroll down, um, you'll see meta reports and meta report cards and it lists every bug fix. Um, I highlighted the, the ones that we felt were the most important here. So those are the questions and that is what I've got. Um, here's to a better year. And if you have questions about customizations and you don't see it um, in that folder, certainly put a ticket in. We'd be happy to answer them for you. And that's what I've got. Corey, did you want to add anything to that for customizations? I do have one more thing, but after about customizations, you want to add something? No, I mean, the only issue that you had seen on the header footer for data access tags was really related to mass print. So you, it was very specific. Most of these bug fixes were very specific. Okay, cool. I do have one other um, thing that we wanted, Corey and I have discussed, the team has discussed, and we would like to um, get your input on this one. Um, it's a report card question, and we appreciate your feedback. So sometime in the next week, <laughs> sometime soon, you'll be getting a survey, and we'll send it out to all the district leaders, and we would ask you to um, reply to this. Um, we're trying to standardize how things are showing up for courses in some different scenarios. So currently, if you had a different course number, um, same course name, different teachers, say Math 101A and 101B, it's going to show up on two different lines, as you see at the top part of the screenshot. Um, same thing happens if you've got the same course number, different sections, different teachers, uh, same course number, same section, you've changed teachers during the year or same course number, same section, and your, your lead teacher's name changed. Maybe she got married. Um, you're seeing it on two lines. One of the things that Corey could do is show it as one line with two teacher names and all the grades on one line. So um, we didn't want to make that decision. We would like to get feedback from everybody on how you would like to see that. So the, the survey basically will be the screenshot with these questions. These are the scenarios. How, do you, how would you like to see those handled? And we'll go from there. We'll see whatever the majority of people want um, or if there are some other things we can do. But um, please feel free to give us any and all feedback that you would Burn. like to see here. Vern's putting his uh, vote in for one line early. <laughs> all right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, I'll add you. I'll write you down, Vern. <laughs> but, um, you know, those are kind of the, the questions that we want. And again, we didn't want to be the ones to say, okay, hey. <laughs> so watch for that to come. And um, if I can find my little stop share, I'll turn it back over to you, Eric. Any, any questions on customizations? Any questions for Sarah? I don't see any online. We're good. All right.
Um, Steven, the scheduling team, you guys are up next. I think they have just a couple of quick uh, scheduling updates. There we go. I unmute myself. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, just a few quick scheduling updates here. Um, so we are in full swing of the scheduling season, of course. We started in December with our preps and our calendar is now updated on the website with trainings all through February. Of course, these will all be held on Zoom. The uh, March work days, power scheduler work days will be added soon for the March calendar. So look out for those and encourage your schedulers to sign up. This Monday, January 11th, we've got the online student request setup training. So this training is for those buildings and, and we see more of them each year using these, these scheduling, these uh, setup screens, these request screens, I should say. When buildings want their students and parents to be able to enter their own request through the parent portal, that's what you need to set up the online request screens for. So there's a little bit of setup in, involved, but the good news for your schedulers is that these carry over year to year. And each year they probably need at least slight modifications for the course groups that are involved there in the actual request screens. But this three hour training that's available next Monday, either morning or afternoon, will help them get set up or just kind of make those little edits and changes to what they need for this year. So we highly encourage whether your schedulers are using the request screens already, have in the past or looking to maybe use them or they're not using them at all and they just wanna learn about uh, how those can help them. Um, it, they, they really came in handy, especially this past year when, when everybody had to be home in March. So, um, but even in a regular school year, they're very beneficial and, and a huge time saver if you set them up right. So uh, encourage your schedulers to come to that. We have a lot of spots available, especially in the PM session this coming Monday. We've got power scheduler preps every Tuesday through the end of January. We had them in December as well. We've had a lot of participation. It's been great. They, um, if your schedulers have not attended a prep session, they do need to attend one prep session. All right, one prep session per building. Only one scheduler needs to actually be the doer there, going through all the steps alongside of us in the Zoom. And, um, but as many schedulers from your building that wanna to come to that are welcome to, but only, um, but only one should actually be the person going through those steps. So if your schedulers have not signed up for a prep session, if you know that or you're unsure, please check in with them, encourage them. Our last prep session officially for the year is gonna be the last Tuesday in January. So that's coming up really quickly. So we've got three more. And then every Thursday, uh, starting next Thursday the 14th, we're going to have work days. So work days are different than the preps because work days allow teams of schedulers to come in. We're gonna put them in each, each building will have their own breakout room to work as long as they want from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in that, in that Zoom breakout room environment together. And when they sign up, when that scheduler signs up, they're gonna sign up for a specific time. And when they sign up for that specific time, that's the guaranteed time that one of the members of our team are able to come in and help them. So it's, it's kind of their guaranteed time for help. But of course, throughout the day, the members of the team will be able to pop back in and out uh, as needed and as, as we're available. So it's really advantageous for your scheduling team to work together in a breakout room session, but also as questions come up throughout the day, call one of us in and we'll, we'll try to get there as quickly as we can. But again, they'll sign up for a specific time and, and that's uh, how they'll know exactly when they'll be able to get help, but they can come in as early as 9 a.m. Uh, make sure that only one of your schedulers per building are signing up for one of those, break, the, those work days. And the reason is we keep count of how many buildings are coming to the work days, not how many schedulers are coming to the work days. So even if there's three schedulers in your building or five in your building, only one of them needs to sign up and then forward that Zoom link when they get it out to the rest of their team. And when they come in, we'll have somebody in the waiting room, the Zoom waiting room, to place them in the correct breakout room when they tell us which building they're with. All right, and then we can work one-on-one -on -one or uh, with the small groups of schedulers as we go into each of the breakout rooms. Um, schedulers can come to as many work days as they want. They can sign up for as many as they want. The only thing we ask, of course, and this, you've heard this one before, is if they're not able to attend and they know that leading up to that day, 
please, or even that morning, you know, worst case scenario, please let a member of the scheduling team know so we can take their RSVP off the Eventbrite list. And because we want as many buildings to be able to get into these uh, sessions as possible, these work days as possible. So please encourage your schedulers to let us know if they're, if they're signed up and they're not able to make it. But if they want to come to, you know, work day a week, um, you know, starting in February, it'll be every Tuesday and Thursday and, and probably something very similar in March. So it, we're trying to keep the dates, the days consistent this year so that they know exactly when to expect, uh, all schedulers know exactly when to expect the work days. Um, I think that's everything I have. Are there any questions about prep sessions, work days, anything the scheduling team is up to these next couple of months? No? Looks good. That's, that's all I have, Eric. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. Awesome. All right. We're humming right along. Um, Steve. Steve-O, bringing up the rear. All right. Bringing up the rear. Can everybody see the Meta Solutions homepage? Yep. Okay. All right. So I just want to give a quick update to the Enterprise Report Project, what we're, how we're trying to maintain these for all of our districts. Uh, we had previously discussed having a roundtable discussion, but with communication with the team and with PowerSchool, we decided a better route was more feasible for us to maintain the enterprise reports for all the districts. So what we decided to do is distribute a large group of enterprise reports as not published to your APEX server. And I will explain the difference in a minute, but you should have access to a master list and the end user documentation. So from the homepage, click on member resources and then click the PowerSchool logo and then the end user documentation on the left. Come on. And then click on helpful docs. And enterprise reports. And then this is your list that you should have access to. If you don't, please let us know. Um, this list just contains a list of, there's like 40, 44, about the headline. Okay, 44 reports that we pushed out as unpublished. Um, it's just a list that has the category of the report, a name of the report, and a brief description. If there is no description, that's either because it's self-explanatory or one was not given to us from an outside source where we got or where we obtained the report. So this is the list that you can refer to. So. Is, is everybody there? Anybody have any questions? So I'm going to show you where these reports are now on your server. So new. Okay. So if you go to your start page, and again, you can do this from district or any building, but mind you, as Amanda alluded to, you need to give yourself, uh, these are roles-based reports. You need to give yourself access in your security settings to view these reports. So from the start page, click on the system reports link here on the left. And then these tabs come across the top, click on enterprise reporting. And the list of available reports for users should pop up here on this list. Okay, so I gotta move this cause I gotta get to this add button. All right, so the check mark means it has been published. Have we given you all 44 reports is published, it would populate this page and it would look ugly and we don't want that. This is our way of having you as district leaders take ownership of an individual specific report by going in and adding it yourself and publishing it once you feel your users need it or you want to give it to them. As of now, only administrators can see what's not published, okay? so. And because all the reports aren't here, doesn't mean they don't exist. They are here in the Apex server and you access it by hitting the add button. And then that drop down, you can see a list of all these reports that are available to add. So if you wanna add one, let's say Meta Student Attendance Summary. Um, the category obviously is attendance, but you have the option of the other five. There are six categories. So obviously it's attendance. 
Um, do you want to publish it? Meaning, do you want anyone who has access to it to see it run it? Or do you want to add it, not publish it? That way you as a district leader have time to review it before you want to give uh, the ability for other people to run it. So let's say we don't want to publish it, so we just leave it as not published. Now the description, you have the ability here to enter whatever you want, or if you desire just to come back here to your um, master list, you see met a student attendance summary, just click on the description there, right click copy, and then you can just drop that in here, okay? So we'll save that and it adds it to your page. You now see Meta Student Attendance Summary. It's not published, meaning only admins can see it at this point and run it. If you feel that you no longer want a report on this page, you can simply remove it by clicking on the dash there on the right and you get a confirmation. Yes, remove it. Removing it as the, the notice stated does not delete it from your server, it just removes it off this page. So that makes you can maintain this page and clean it up as you wish. So that's all I wanted to show you at this time. Um, if you go through here and you do not see a report in this drop down or on the enterprise report page that's compared to this list that I showed you, um, let us know through web help tickets because there are technical glitches and we're at the mercy of netherworld. Sometimes it does not import for whatever reason or a URL gets skipped. It happens. So if you have a need and you do not see a report or two or even several, let us know um, and then we'll get that assessed. Also, existing reports, if you're utilizing a report and you want a couple fields, added to a specific report, let us know again through um, web help ticket. Um, the other thing is if as a district leader, you want to try and create and write your own report, we ask at Meta to not prefix a page number with 90,000 and above. These page numbers are internal ID numbers to the reports and they number from one to 99,999. Meta wants to reserve the 90,000 above number range for our internal use because there are going to be updates to existing reports and we want the ability to distribute any update on a, a specific report to everybody without overriding any report that you may have created. And that's a no-no, we don't wanna do that. So that is, um, we're just requesting not to use a prefix of 90,000 and above. So um, let me see, is that anything else I wanna say? Oh, there is going to be a boot camp, I think in mid-March, Laura, I don't know what time, what day specifically. It's going to be after the district leader meeting in March. Okay, and it's going to focus specifically probably on just the end user like we did uh, uh, last year. Yeah, just, so. I think your focus, yeah, will be how to, just how to use enterprise reports, not necessarily to create enterprise reports or anything like that. It's just gonna be, once you get to enterprise reports, how you actually run them. Okay, well, if there's no questions on us, that's all I had. I just wanna give a brief update. So I hope everybody's doing good. Welcome back. Happy New Year. The, eight, the first rule of 2021 is never talk about 2020, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Steve. Any questions for, I guess at this point, we're kind of wrapping things up. So any questions for Steve or anybody else on the team? Um, all right. Anybody signed up for the boot camp this afternoon? Grad plan or grad pathways. If you're not and you want to attend, I, I believe there's probably still seats say, available, right? Yeah, yeah, there is. There was quite a few signed up. So you guys starting at 1230? 1230. 1230 to 3. Okay. Um, and then the only other reminder, um, we're kind of we're sticking with our every other month. So no district leader meeting in February. Uh, we'll come back and Hopefully by then we'll be through the worst of the cold weather. Uh, <laughs> wishful thinking anyway. Uh, we'll come back and we'll, we'll meet on March 4th.
<laughs> all right, all. If nothing else, appreciate your time. And I think there were some questions earlier. We'll, we'll get, um, as soon as this recording is available, we'll get this posted out to the YouTube channel. And those of you who are uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel, you should get notification that it's, that it's once it's been posted, it's available. All right. Thanks all. Thank you. We'll bye everybody. All right, bye. Take care.